everybody wants to hear the story about somebody who was in their shoes facing the same problem that they're facing right now. That is the most helpful type of story you could ever tell someone. And those few words at the beginning just lets them know that the story that's about to follow is one of those type of stories. But again, I'm not going to tell you whether I succeeded or failed. I'm not going to tell you what my conclusion was. I'm not going to tell you how I solved the situation. You have to listen to the story to learn those things. All I'm letting you know up front is that's the kind of story you're about to hear. Deal analysis, the number one critical skill every multifamily investor must know. Want to take your investing career to the next level? Then check out Think Multifamily's Deal Analysis Workshop. For more information, go to thinkmultifamily.com forward slash D-A-W. Thank you for being with us again today. I'm so grateful that you're back. Thank you. I hope that you'll listen to this segment of shows and you'll be encouraged to be a more effective leader while doing that. Would you hit the like button and subscribe to the show? I would be so grateful if you would leave us a written rating and review on iTunes. Also, if you'll do that, I will have a special gift for you. You can send us a screenshot of that review to info at lifebridgecapital.com and we'll get you a gift in the mail personally from me. So I want to thank you again for listening. Have a blessed day. Leaders that are effective tell great stories. That's what our guest today told us just yesterday. And I want to thank the listeners for being back with us again today. I hope you heard Paul Smith yesterday talk about, we went through 10 stories that leaders should tell. I know all of us, whether you're a passive investor or whether you're active, you want to be an effective leader. And maybe it's just a leader in your home or in your church or organization, your business, whatever that may be. We all like to think of ourselves as an effective leader. And there's a great way that's going to help you to do just that. Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. This is good. Awesome. Well, today we want to help the, you, the listener and myself to dive in to storytelling. Yesterday we covered some of why that's so important, even 10 examples, 10 different examples of stories that every leader should know or kind of have in their tool belt to tell. And today we want to help you think through and that structure of a story. And Paul is going to help us to do just that. So Paul, thank you again for your time. I cannot thank you enough. But how can a story structure help craft just a better story? You know, oftentimes we're asking questions, we kind of fumble through our words, right? I've done it so many times that way. But thinking through that structure, get us started. Yeah. So, well, that's exactly why it helps. And that moment where you want to tell the story and you're fumbling through your words and not knowing exactly where to start and when to stop and what to say next, that's awkward, right? It, that's clearly not the best delivered story is one that just fumbles its way through. So having a structure just makes it easier for the storyteller, the leader to tell the story because they know exactly how they're going to tell the story and they don't have to just make it up as they go along and fumble through their words. But the other reason I think it's important to have a structure is if you think about the great stories you've heard compared to the awful stories that you've heard, the awful stories tend to just be a rambling run on mess. <laughs> you know, and I don't think you want your story to sound that way. Now, there are lots of different story structures that you could use. And in fact, I studied as many of them as I could in doing the research for it. And you've heard of several of these and you probably studied them yourselves. In fact, when you were probably in the third grade and you started, you did your first book report, do you remember the structure that the teacher taught you to do your oral presentation of the book report or of any, of any little speech that you gave? There was the very first structure we're ever taught. I don't. I wish I did. Okay. Well, I'll say it and see if, the, if you remember this. So introduction, body, conclusion. That's right. Right. Yeah. And then they had a little, the way that they would tell you to remember that was tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them, right? Introduction, body, conclusion. And if you're doing a book report, it's that still works. That's a great structure, but that's a terrible structure for a story. And this is another reason why leaders need a structure for stories is because the ones that we've been taught in the past for various things like making a presentation don't work really well. Okay, so making a presentation is not the same as telling a story. You know, so as an adult, we still kind of follow that introduction body conclusion. If you're going to make a recommendation, you got a presentation to give, you get up in front of the audience, you got your PowerPoint slides behind you. First thing you do is here's my recommendation. And then I'm going to go through all the reasons why that's why I'm recommending the board of directors adopt this new whatever, whatever, which is kind of like that introduction body conclusion. And at the end, you're going to remind them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sign here, decide this or fund this or whatever. Again, that works great if you're making a, a presentation or a recommendation, but can you imagine a story that worked that way? 
Well, I'm going to tell you up front, the boat sinks. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you the whole story or, you know, I'm going to tell you who got murdered. And then I'm going to tell you like stories don't work that way. Stories have a very different structure. And there are a lot of story structures that will work. And the ones that your audience most likely have heard of is the hero's journey storytelling structure, because it's one that the Hollywood uses a lot. And But the problem is it's like a 17 step plot structure, you know, and that's just the plot. You know, there's a lot of other things that have to happen before the plot and then learning the lesson afterwards and making a recommendation. That's just the plot. So if you're going to try and tell a story and do you remember how long the story should be? How many minutes? Like two or three minutes. Yeah. From our conversation yesterday, two, three, four minutes, right? You don't have time for Joseph Campbell's 17 step hero's journey storytelling structure, right? Plus it's just too hard to remember. So that's probably not a good one. You need a short one, but the introduction body, introduction body conclusion is not helpful enough and it's really not the right order. So what you need is something in between those two. And what I found works the best, and I'll, I'll give you two ways to remember it. One is the more academic structure, which is uh, first of all, a hook. You need to get people's attention. Then you go through the main part of the story, which is the context, challenge, conflict, resolution, right? There's also going to be a lesson and a recommended action at the end. But what I found in teaching this is that using the more academic sounding parts of a story is more difficult for people to remember and harder for them to know, well, what goes in what part? So what I found to be the easiest is just that there are eight questions your story needs to answer. And if you answer these eight questions in this order, a story will emerge in a way that makes sense to the audience and will be effective for you, the leader. All right. So here are those eight questions. First of all, why should I bother listening to the story, right? You got to give your audience a reason to listen to you, or they may not. Okay. Once you've done that adequately, and I can give you some tips on how to do that in a minute. But once you've done that, you've kind of earned the right to answer the next five questions. And those are the main part of the story, right? So here those are where and when did it take place? Who's the main character and what did they want? What was the problem or opportunity they ran into? What did they do about it? And how did it turn out in the end? Right now, those should sound like the natural flow of a story because of course it is the natural flow of a story. But if you're keeping track, that's only six. So there are two more. What did you learn from the story? And what do you think I should go do now? Right. Those are questions seven or eight. So if you'll notice that first question is just your opportunity to get the audience's attention. The next five questions actually tell the story. And then the last two questions are where you drive some action with the story. So what was the lesson you learned? And therefore, what should you go do now? The recommended action. So that's kind of the flow that a leader should tell a story. Now, if you're just telling a story around the campfire to entertain people, well, you don't need question number one and you sure don't need question seven or eight. You just tell the five in the middle. You just tell the story, right? But if you're telling a story in business, you need to do both of those things. You need to get their attention at the beginning because they might not listen to you <laughs> if you don't. And you need to drive some action at the end. So those are the eight questions. Do any of those sound familiar from two, three months ago when you were in class? Yes, it does. And I, I was thinking too, I had a question for you about, you said like if you're in business, you might tell or certain scenarios, you may only tell the middle section or, you know, depending on who the group is. But I was thinking about, you mentioned in business, but if we're talking to our immediate team members, we may not need parts of those things, right? But the difference I'm just taking would be like, if I'm speaking in business to on a stage to a group of people I've never met before. So, well, in that case, I think you probably need all, all right. eight of them. As I mean, that'd be the difference. Right. Yeah. If you're the group of people and you already have their full attention, like there's only 15 people in the room and it's your turn to make a presentation and you stand up and all eyes are upon you, eh, maybe you can just start the story because you've already got everybody's attention and they're and you're only going to talk for two, three minutes telling the story. You're not going to lose their attention in that short amount of time. Another situation where you maybe don't need all these questions is the last two questions. Okay. And here's why. Ideally, when you tell a story, you answer questions one through six you let the audience answer questions seven or eight. And here's why. People are far more passionate about pursuing their ideas than they are about pursuing your ideas, right? So the whole benefit, the reason why stories are so magical is because they turn your idea into their idea, as opposed to typical leadership strategy is, I'm going to tell my people what to do, right? I'm the boss and I'm going to boss them around, right? I mean, there's times where you have to do that. That's the job of the leader. You have to set direction and tell people what to do. And but again, people are more passionate about pursuing their ideas than they are about pursuing the boss's ideas. If you tell them a story and they learn this lesson themselves, then it's their idea to go off and do the thing that you probably wanted them to do anyway. So if you pick the right story to tell and you do a halfway decent job of telling it, 
by the end of the story, by the end of question six, when the story is actually done, your audience will have learned the lesson you wanted them to learn, and they'll already have convinced themselves to go do the thing that you want them to do. So telling them at the end, okay, so now here's the lesson you should have learned and here's what you should go do next is unnecessary. In fact, it's counterproductive, right? They've already, look, I already figured that out. I heard the story. That was great. I'm exactly going to go do what you probably want me to do. You don't need to ruin that by then telling them again to go do it. If you're going to boss somebody around, you don't even need to bother telling them the story first. Just go ahead and boss them around. So answer questions one through six and then pause and just listen see how the audience responds. And if they tell you they learned the lesson that you wanted them to learn and they're going to go do what you want them to do, perfect, you're done. Now, if they don't, if they learned the wrong lesson, and that can happen sometimes, these are stories, they're open to human interpretation, that's no problem. You can always redirect them, right? You can say, oh, you know, that's an interesting conclusion. I thought about that too. I came to a different conclusion and here's why. You know, or, you know, that's one step, next step you could take. I'd recommend a different one and here are my reasons why. So you can always revert to what you would have told them if you didn't tell them the story to get them back on track, but give the story a chance to work first. And that happens between questions six and seven. So yes, you could be in a situation with a familiar audience where you only answer five of those questions, questions two through seven. You don't have to get their attention because you've already got it and you don't have to tell them what to conclude because they're smart people and they got it the first time. You mentioned when you were going through the those eight questions that there you may have some tips on why I should listen to the story, why they should mm -hmm. listen to the story if we do need that. Yeah. What are some of those tips? Yeah, so it's really just a sentence or two where you're letting the audience know that if they will listen to you for the next two or three or four minutes, they're going to learn something that's important to them, not to you, but to them. So if somebody comes to you with a problem, you could just say, yeah, you know what? Here's what you got to do. You got to do this, this, and this, and that'll solve your problem. That's what a typical boss would do, right? And that's good. Just sometimes you need to give people clear direction. But if you want to use a story to help them understand the right thing to do, you might get their attention or get them to want to listen to your story by saying, yeah, that is a tough problem. Let me tell you what I did five years ago when I had your job and I ran into the same problem. Okay. And then tell your story. Right, That one or two sentences, what that lets them know is that, oh my gosh, this person used to have my job and they ran into the same problem that I'm having right now. And they're about to tell me what happened. And that's all they know. They don't know. Notice they don't know whether you succeeded or failed at solving the problem, but it doesn't matter because they're going to learn something important either way. They're either going to learn a way to not handle the situation because what you did failed miserably and almost got you fired. Or they're going to learn, oh yeah, he did this and it worked. So that's what I'm going to do. All they know is that you have been in their shoes and you're about to tell them your experience. Everybody wants to hear that story. Everybody wants to hear the story about somebody who was in their shoes facing the same problem that they're facing right now. That is the most helpful type of story you could ever tell someone. And those few words at the beginning just lets them know that the story that's about to follow is one of those type of stories. But again, I'm not going to tell you whether I succeeded or failed. I'm not going to tell you what my conclusion was. I'm not going to tell you how I solved the situation. You have to listen to the story to learn those things. All I'm letting you know up front is that's the kind of story you're about to hear because the goal of the hook, the goal of that first question is to get them to want to listen to your story. That's all it is. And that is the simplest way to do it. When I think about a scenario like that, where somebody's come to you and said, you know, I've had this problem. I love that. You're like, you're relating them right away. You, you know, you're showing respect for one. You had some struggles as well, right? Allowing them to relate to you and you're being just real transparent, all those things, building credibility. I think just uh, immediately by saying that, how much of this is on the fly versus like you've already thought through these eight questions or you've already built this story ahead of time so you're prepared for this? Or maybe it's a question you get often, but obviously there's going to be questions that you're not asked often as well and you may try to tell a story. So how much is kind of on the fly? You you know these eight questions, you're building that kind of as you're, as you're speaking versus, no, I've got these 10 stories or however many prepared ahead of time. Yeah. So yeah, great question. You would be better served obviously as a leader if you had more of these stories in your repertoire to use when the time is right, right? <laughs> so the best leaders have already cultivated this repertoire of stories, the story bank that they can draw upon when they're in the right situation. And if they've already thought through, if and when I need to tell the story, here's kind of the answer to the eight questions. Here's how I would tell it. They're going to be more prepared. 
right? The worst time to tell a story is when you don't have a good story to tell. <laughs> that just sounds terrible. It, obviously, you're just faking your way through this conversation and trying to make, or you tell a story that's completely irrelevant just because, well, I've got this really good story and I'm trying to shoehorn it into the conversation wherever I can find a place to put it because I love the story. Well, that's not helpful to the audience. So you'd be better served to have as big of a repertoire of stories as you could and then go ahead and think through. In fact, the way I recommend to people to save and remember their stories is just like in a Word document, just type out the answer to the eight questions in short little bullet points. And that way, if you can find it when you need it, oh yeah, what was that story about the guy in the tank? Yeah, I'll search tank. Oh yeah, here it is. And you don't have a script, but you just have little bullet pointed answers to the eight questions. And that way, every time you tell the story, it'll sound extemporaneous and conversational, which is exactly the way you want it to sound. But yet you have thought through how you would answer this. So when you tell a story, it's often flying by the seat of your pants in that like you didn't know you were going to need to tell the story because the problem just came up during the meeting and you, oh, I need to tell the story. But what you don't want to do is make up the story as you go along. It'd be better if you've thought through it ahead of time. So I recommend spend time cultivating your stories so that they're ready to go when you need them. For sure. I think even learning to do some public speaking, or if I'm speaking from the stage, I have to like break the talk down into different stories. And that's helpful for me to remember that way as well. Or even if I need to speak for 20 minutes versus 45 minutes, right? Oh, I'm going to add a couple of different stories in there or take one out that I know takes me about 10 minutes or whatever that may be, but that took some practice. And I can tell too, though, as I've, if I don't speak for a few months, I'm rusty, right? I've got to follow up on some of those stories, but it helps me to even feel so much more confident on the stage. Right. Yeah. So those should be easier. The ones where you're going into a situation where you know you're going to tell these three stories. Right. You should definitely plan ahead and think through how am I going to tell them or what are the answer to the eight questions? Uh, speak to the structure, say, you know, whether it's a sales story versus leadership or a parenting or, you know, whatever it may be. How does that structure change or does it? It doesn't. Okay. The same structure works for any of these types of stories. So I, I give you the list of 10 leadership stories, same structure for all of them. Parenting stories, same way. Sales stories, the same. The structure and the method of telling these stories is not different. What's different is what the story is about, who are the main characters, the problems they ran into, the solutions they found, the lessons that people learned from them, the action that you'll go take as a result of it. Those things are all completely different from one story to the next, but the methods are the same, which is one of the reasons that it, it makes such sense to learn these methods because they can be used for every type of story. Yeah, that is so helpful <laughs> that it's not different for everyone, right? And I, I just think, you know, when you're telling a story, obviously there's a lot of if it's a good story, you're engaged emotionally, right? And is that, I assume that's dependent upon the story, right? Or, you know, does the structure affect that, right? Or if we get the structure mixed up, you know, we get the, the problem before the main character potential. I don't even know how you do that, but, but you know what I mean? Or there's something that's mixed up. Does that affect? Yeah. So the structure is the way it is for a reason. The, something should happen before others. Knowing where and when something happened, which is question number two, needs to go at near the beginning. And the reason is because if people don't know where, when what's happening is they get confused, they get frustrated. They don't know if it's a true story or not. Like, you know, when you tell somebody, you know, uh, 25 years ago at Camp Pendleton, California on this tank battlefield, oh, okay. They'll assume that this is a true story. And by the way, that was a true story because you told me exactly where and when it happened. But if I don't tell you where, when it happened, or if I say once upon a time in a land far away, like you, you know that it's made up. So, and it frustrates people when they don't know, am I listening to a real story or am I listening to something you're just making up? So that question really does need, there's an, an emotional, mental, psychological reason why it needs to be at the beginning. And then how the story ends needs to go at the end. Otherwise you've ruined the surprise, which is very different than making a presentation where you lead with the end, you know? So yes, the order does matter and it throws the audience off when you don't have things in the right order. Now, there are some clever ways to change a few things. And if in tomorrow's episode, we talk about the element of surprise, I'll tell you how to do that. But the first place you should stay is follow the structure. I'm going to make a note of that. So I know to bring it up. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so great. It just think through the structure and uh, these stories that we need to be able to tell. I just, maybe, you know, some people think, well, wait a minute, you know, this is going to take me a lot of time, Paul, to think about all these stories I need to be able to tell and, and time to practice. And how have you done that well? Or how have you seen other leaders do that well? Time spent, how many stories should we have in our toolbox? And you know, how do we think about that? 
Yeah. Well, first of all, I think you're right. This is going to take some time. Yeah, it will. <laughs> but it's going to be some of the most important time that you spend. And in fact, that's the number one realization I think people need to have is these stories aren't just some offhanded comments that might make every conversation a little more interesting, but that's not really necessary. It's not really the main thing that I'm there to do as the leader. No, they are. Like you should only be telling stories 10 to 15% of the time. Out of a one hour meeting, if you do that math, that's six to nine minutes out of a 60 minute meeting, you might be telling stories. And since the stories are only two or three minutes long, that means you might tell two or three, three minute stories over the course of a one hour meeting. That's it. But those are going to be the most memorable parts of that meeting. A month later, they're not going to remember the bullet points on slide number 72, but they will remember the two stories that you told. So your most important leadership messages need to be embedded in the stories because that's what people are going to remember. So think about these as this is the most important part of my communication strategy. Of course, I should spend some time working on it. If your boss asks you to write a memo on something, you wouldn't just sit down and start typing some random stuff and like make it up as you go along. You'd go do your homework, right? You'd go do some analysis and do some research and figure out the answer to the question. Then, then finally put together the memo. A story is the same. Yeah, you got to go do some research. You want to tell a story about X. Well, were you there? Did it happen to you? Well, if not, then you might need to call the person who the story happened to and get the facts right. And where, when did it go through the eight questions with them? Where and when did this happen? Who else was there other than you? What was the problem you were trying to solve? What did you do? About, like ask them all the eight questions. Yeah, it takes some homework and it will absolutely be worth it. No doubt. One final question in this segment I was just thinking about was, you know, if I'm having a meeting with my team every week as a group, and let's say it's an hour and a half, and we do have a structure for that meeting. So we're as purposeful as possible. It doesn't have to be an hour and a half. I'll cut it off definitely short if we're not, you know, there's nothing to, to talk about. We're cutting it off and doing something else. However, it's an important time, right, for our week and that other people can bring things up and we're talking through different things. Should I, as a leader, be prepared to tell a story every week? No, but somebody should. One person on your team should be prepared to tell a story, to share a story every week. Okay. I don't know how big your team is, but having somebody every month or two have to tell a story is not that big of a burden, but this is one of the best ways to build your collective repertoire. We just talked about, you know, do we, we need this repertoire of stories to tell? Well, how do you build this repertoire? Well, you share the work, right? Like all my stories don't have to be about me, remember? And they shouldn't be. Okay. So if every week and assign them ahead of time, like this week, you know, is your week and next week is my week and next week is Bob's week. And then it's Sally's week, you know, and then three months later, it's back to your week. Everybody knows that on that week, I've got to bring in an interesting story that would be useful to people at work and they prepare for it and they come in and that's five minutes of your 90 minute meeting. That's it, right? Two or three minutes to tell the story, a couple of minutes to talk about it, then move on to the regular business. And after a year, you're going to have 52 great stories that everybody can tell. But no, I absolutely should not just be your burden. Everybody should have to do that. Awesome. But there should be a story every time. Yeah. But yeah, that's awesome. It coming from There's going to be one that probably happens just by accident, right? <laughs> I mean, you're in a 90 minute meeting. Somebody's going to tell a story at some point. But my point is be more intentional about it. Have people bring in stories that they think would be useful if added to everybody else's repertoire of stories. I think that's a great way to curate and collect stories. That's so helpful. Paul, Thank you so much for another interview that's helped us so much. These eight questions, it's going to help us to build a great story. Again, I want to tell the listeners, hope you'll go back and listen to yesterday's show with Paul, where we talked about, I mean, we went through what 10 stories that leaders should be able to tell. It's going to help you in a massive way, become an effective leader. And then these eight questions today, that's going to help us to build those stories. Hey, and tomorrow we're going to jump into some techniques that I know you're not going to want to miss. Thank you again, Paul. Yeah, you bet. I'm already looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.